Good evening, folks. Um, <clears throat> I just uh, I just thought to do this quick live video on the uh, the Corona uh, and the Corona pandemic. Uh, that's rage in hell um, around the world and um, and today we uh, unfortunately had our first case uh, in Liberia um, you know I I I'm the sort of person I am seldom uh, frightened, you know. Uh, I, I don't easily panic or worry, you know. But, uh, and when the virus, when the outbreak uh, uh, erupted in Wuhan, China, to be honest, in the initial stages, I thought it was going to be one of those viruses like SARS. Uh, you remember the SARS virus? Severe uh, respiratory syndrome or something. Initially, that's what I, I, I had hoped that it would be one of those things. And then after a while, it would fizzle out. But I did not imagine that. Corona would in no time become a global pandemic. Now, it was not until last week that WHO declared Corona a pandemic. Now, the difference between a pandemic and an epidemic is a, pan a pandemic is, is um, a public health crisis with global uh, happening on a global scale like the corona is happening all over the world that is a, a pandemic uh, an epidemic is is a viral infection or public health such situation that is happening on a that is restricted in a certain part of the world. Take Ebola, for example. Ebola was like that. It was happening only in certain parts of the world. Now, this thing is getting really, really serious um, to the point where I'm getting scared. And, and uh, uh, there's this myth that our part of the world is, does not Africa, that is, uh, is, is immune from it. And some people actually were leading themselves to believe that. But that's not the case. Uh, the coronavirus does not seem to be a discriminatory one. It looks like it can rage hell and wreak havoc anywhere uh, in the world. Um, there are going to be disastrous um, effects. The experts have said that this thing is not going away anytime soon. Uh, today, President Trump, was it today? President Trump said, according to what his advisors have told him, that it looks like Corona is going to be around for the entirety of summer. That is, you're talking about July to August of this year. That is several months from now. So it is really, really scary. Uh, no matter how you look at it, um, it's really, really scared. Italy, which is the hardest, his, the hardest hit country in all of Europe, is on lockdown. And they've seen their lives uh, constricted and afflicted by this virus, um, you know, in such a way that they haven't experienced in their lifetimes. You see, this pandemic of this proportion has not happened since, listen, most people alive have not experienced this, this 
pandemic on this scale. It hasn't been experienced by most of us alive today. And uh, the death toll continues to increase. In fact, the Italian Prime Minister Conte said that because of the increase in the, in the infection rate, more and more people are becoming infected in Italy, and so many people have been quarantined or have been uh, in the ICUs across the country, they're going to, if this thing runs into another week or two, they, they're going to have to begin to consider treating people based on age. So for example, if you're 80 and above in Italy, a week or two from now, they're not going to bother to treat you anymore because the people, the people who are in that particular age bracket, in fact, from 60 and above, those people tend to be more uh, sus susceptible to not only catching the virus, but dying off the, off the virus. So the Italians are going to be doing like, okay, you're old, and so your chances of recovery are very, very small compared to a younger person who has a stronger immune system that can combat the, the virus and be able to over, overcome it. I mean, it is, it is a very precarious thing for a country to be faced with, to have to choose between saving the lives of people younger or saving the lives of some of its citizens as opposed to letting others die because it is overwhelmed and cannot deal with the gravitas, the skill, the enormity of the, ch of the challenge. So if a country as sophisticated as Italy, one of the most developed countries in the world, is talking about that, then you should know this thing is scary. It is very, very scary. Now you have the mayor of the largest of the of, of of one of the largest cities in the world new york mayor uh, uh, bill uh, de blasio and the governor andrew Cuomo, and you have them constantly informing the public that they are overwhelmed they don't have enough hus hospitals they don't have enough beds in new york and they've deployed the national guard to help construct uh, makeshift medical facilities to be able to accommodate people and, and, and the infection rate just keeps going up and going up. You can't find hand sanitizers in America. Not only that, I mean, toilet, toiletry in general, things are getting worse and scary. I mean, the stock market is, 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 is in tatters. In fact, today at some point, they had to shut down the stock market, the New York Stock Exchange. I mean, the Dow lost about what, 9.6% in a single day. Today, they had to shut it down. People have, have the stock market has lost over a trillion dollars since the outbreak hit America. It is a serious crisis. This is not partisan, it's not political. It is so, so serious and it is scary. Very, very scary. The United States um, airline industry it's a, there's an umbrella group of them. It's called the, uh, the and uh, uh, something something. They, they they have requested for federal funding for fifty billion dollars. American airliners are catching hell. Lots of people aren't flying, uh, and so you know how Americans love love to travel. They're requesting for a fifty billion dollar aid package, a bailout package. American Airlines, all of American Airlines, I'm not talking about the airline, I'm talking about the industry, the American aviation in the industry, commercial airlines together are asking for 50 billion US dollars because they are losing revenue in, 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 in the, people aren't flying as much as they used to fly because people are afraid to fly as they should be. Then you have American the, the airports in America are also asking for $10 billion from the federal gov government. Airports are asking to get built out. Because when airlines aren't flying, airports aren't generating revenue which they use to pay their workers. So you have the airports are asking for a $10 billion bailout. You, you have... The airlines are asking for $50 billion in America alone. Now... You have 
four of the largest airliners or air airline alliances in the world, like um, Star Alliance and One Group or One World, and they are asking for bailout too. They represent about fifty-eight percent of the global air traffic, you know, carriers. You know, fifty-eight percent, and they're asking for billions and billions of dollars. You know, so they're catching hell. And, 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 and I heard Governor Andrew Cuomo say, and I, just before we go to Liberia, I just want to let you how how very disastrous this thing is on, on, on the international scale. I heard Governor Andrew Cuomo of New York say, one of the problems they've had in New York is, if you say you want to shut down schools and kids don't go to school, then you have another problem. Because many of these kids are fed in schools. You know, they get, they get breakfast in school, and they get uh, lunch in school. So if they don't go to school, how do they get fed? Another thing he said, and I agree with, and I've been pondering over, is the fact that many of their parents are working, the working parents, or most of their parents are working people. So the point is, how do they care for their kids when these kids are not in school? Then you're talking about a huge, uh, another problem, which is child care. How do they care for their kids when they've got to go to work? This is serious. It is extremely serious. The great United States of America, they're talking about not having enough resources to do enough testing in time to be able to know how many people have been infected and how they can bring this under control. So, now, I wanted to lay this out before I go to our own country. Now, you're talking about America, New York of all places, the great New York state, and the great New York City, they are complaining that they don't have enough resources, they don't have enough beds to accommodate people who are getting infected with the coronavirus. They don't even, even have enough test kits to test people. They don't. So far, the only country in the world which is doing a, a terrific job in testing effectively is South Korea. The, the South Koreans are the experts at it. They're amazing. They've already tested over a million people in South Korea. I think well over a million people. But the Americans are lagging behind. And these are the people we often will cry out to for help. Now let's come to our country, Liberia. This is a part that really scares me. I heard a recording today. I don't know whether many of you have heard. I'm going to probably play it for you. The driver of the of Nat Blama. And by the way, I know I know Nat Blama personally. I've known him for some time now. We all uh he we were in line room together when Winston Tubman was there and, and you know and I gotta know him since that time. And then of course he joined the CDC, his party supported the CDC and that's how he landed himself the job that he that he got. So I know Nat Blama. We have a situation. The situation we have is that Nat Blama and other government officials, there's another guy called Jeremiah Shokin or something, they went abroad for some sort of, you know how they love to travel, all these useless government trips. And I feel sorry for Nat Blama. You know, I know many people are, are blasting him and because some people uh, uh, cannot seem to remove the political lenses. You know, I think the partisan lenses i think we should remove the partisan lenses and we look at this thing as a as a problem that affects all all of us irrespective of your political party you know this is not about which party uh, you are from because whether you are a citizen or a up person coronavirus does not care so the the the, the point i'm making is that let's show some uh some empathy here Let's show some sympathy, sympathy because it might be you, you know. Now, Blama, I'm sure, you know, did not intend to get infected and come to Liberia and try to infect other people. Now, I'm told Nat Blama returned on Thursday of last week. That's a good amount of time that he's been in Liberia. There are very good chances that Nat Blama must have come in contact with a great many people. It's also possible he may have gone to work. It's all, it's, it's his, his wife or his girlfriend, if he's married, I, I don't know Nat's 
marital status, but I'm sure he has a, a, a significant other. He's got friends. He must have hung, hung out with folks over the weekend. His driver who picked him up from the airport must have also himself um, come mingle with people. Must have been in physical proximity of people uh, with the possibility of people contracting the virus from him if he indeed contracted from his boss, which is a very strong chance because Nat has been home since Thursday of last week. And I heard a recording. Nat Blaman's driver said he reported himself when he heard that his boss had tested positive for the virus he reported him himself. The ambulance came, they picked him up, and they told him that they were going to take him to the testing center somewhere at uh, uh, somewhere here, Debbie or Redemption, or somewhere. He said they were taking him. I listened to the, re to, the re to the recording. It's very disturbing. It is scary. Now this this is a scary part. This is an extremely scary part. Not Blaman's driver is explaining. And I'll play the recording for you shortly, but let me just indulge in, in me the voice over it a, a little bit. He is saying that they put him in an ambulance and they took him, they were supposedly taking him to a, uh, a coronavirus treatment facility, something like that, right? And they go and they keep him in the ambulance in front of the barracks. I'm sure he's talking about the Kesley barracks on the Robertsfield Highway. He says he is sitting there in the ambulance. For up to six hours, they had not admitted him. They had not tested him. He's in the ambulance. They parked the ambulance on the highway. He's there. Then John Griffield, journalist John Griffield posted on his Facebook page that he spoke with uh, with uh, Nat Blamans, someone who probably a friend or a relative. And this relative of Nat Blaman confided in Jala Greyfield and authorized him to publish it, the, con the conversation. Nat Blaman said he was taken to Redemption Hospital, supposedly to be put on bed and, and they can begin the treatment. And he said he had been at Redemption Hospital, not on any bed, no tubes, you know, put on him or anything of the sort. And he was just there, and for hours, he had not been giving any food. Are you freaking kidding me? Corona is a sophisticated, advanced flu. The person needs to be drinking a lot of fluids. You need to keep them uh, uh, very hydrated. They have to be taking a lot of fluids. Corona is a, is a, is a mess. And Nat Blaman said, according to Jarrah Grayfield, that he was, this is a government official, a top-level government official taken to Redemption Hospital, kept there for hours, completely, he had been given no food, and that there was no electricity in the place where they took him. Are you freaking kidding me? Is this how we're going to fight the coronavirus? And you, no, 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 no. You, you are, now you're going to scare people. The thing about it is that people are going to be scared to come forward. Because if you take people who have tested positive or might be suspect of having contacted a virus from someone with whom they had uh, come in physical con contact, how would other people be able to come forward when they fear that they might have con contracted the virus? Because when they start hearing someone like Nat Blama complaining that he was taken to Redemption Hospital and hadn't been treated, and they hadn't given him any, any food, and they hadn't, and there was no electricity at redemption. Now, does this surprise us? No, it does not. It does not surprise me. This, these are the conditions that are quite common, that are very mundane across the health, the healthcare service delivery uh, system in, Li in Liberia. Since we came to power, there's been a, a deterioration. But the problem here is this. We had expected because we had enough time, ample time ahead of time, to plan, to prepare special facilities to treat people who contract the virus. We didn't have to wait. Now, not Blama is saying he's not been treated. He said he was there for six, for several hours. Since they, were, since they took him in this morning, 
He is complaining that he has not been fed. He is complaining that he has not been treated or he is not being treated. He is complaining that the facility in which they put him at redemption has no electricity. Then Nat Blama's driver is saying they kept him at, in the ambulance for six hours. Do you know what it means to be kept in an ambulance? Someone who is a personal chauffeur of someone who has tested positive, not Blama, that would be, and you keep him in the ambulance for six hours, you don't take him for testing? In the and then to the point where he has his cell phone, he picks up his cell phone, and who does he call? He calls the radio station. Listen to what he had to say. Listen to this. Listen. Listen to this. This is what Nat Blaman's driver had to say. Huh? He had to say this. Listen to this. This stuff is scary. Yeah, my boss, man. What boss is he? So I said, but then since uh, my boss, man, is positive, let me call it. The, the Listen to this. If you can hear the recording, let me know, folks. This is not Blaman's driver in conversation with, I believe, Kelvin Deming of Prime FM. Listen to him. After he learned that his boss had, had tested positive, he called the people to report himself. A good citizen. We should encourage more of this sort of behavior for people to voluntarily come forward if they believe they have been in proximity with someone who has tested positive. Listen to him. They have things so they can come and they do my test. We got a whole job from the airport to the house. So when I call the people, they go and put me in the air. That means the people, I saw the ambulance to my house, and then they came and asked for me, I come and I did it myself. And they told me to get the ambulance. I walk in the ambulance. They said, oh, bring me to redemption. I, while, while on my way, unfortunately, they passed by redemption and brought me all the way uh, to the barrier here. So I asked them, I said, boy, you told me you're telling me to return. So why are you put me away here? They said, I know, they don't give me no good story. And since today, I think that the six hours now, they're sitting in the ambulance, even the kid, I'm tired of sitting in, in the ambulance now, I want to get around and go home. I told them to get me back. If they can't find a solution, let them carry me back home. Okay. I'm commenting myself. Okay, so let's do it first, uh, uh, step by step. Uh, did you drive your bus from the airport to his home? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, what, what day? What day was it? It was on Friday. Friday night by eight. Okay. Uh, who, along with your boss, was on the vehicle? Who uh, all were on the car? His security and myself. We call him Mauro. Okay. His security were on the car. Yes, sir. Were you? So that three yes, or you? Yes, sir. So from the airport, where did you guys go? From the airport straight to the house, and then you go out from the car and went straight upstairs in your room. And then you le you you leave from there, you go home, eh? Yes, sir. Okay. So after Friday, did you go back to the hall again? After Friday, Saturday morning, I went to your house. I took the car. I washed the car. After washing the car, I didn't see him. Actually, when I went there in the morning, I didn't see him. He was still in your room. Mm. I took the car, watched the car, everything. After then, he told me to go home. How long you been driving for Honorable Blama? Is, I'm going to three years now. Okay, three years now. Yes, sir. We are told reliably that you are a member of the First Baptist Church. Is it true? Yes, I'm the mem I'm member of First Baptist Church, and I also play the, the instrument in the church. Okay, and then we are told, when was the last time you participated in the choir? Okay, I it was on um, because after Friday when you came, I didn't practice. Saturday I didn't practice. Uh, they called me that I was going for a concert to St. Nangwe Church on 13th Street. So you went so, to St. Nangwe Church? Yes, sir. I went to St. Nangwe Church and then I attended the, 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 the program. You attended the program. How long did you stay in the church? I stayed there from morning to, to afternoon. The service, everything was over. You shook hands and mate. Did you shake hands with people? Uh, yes. Are you married? Yes, sir. Uh, when was the last? Have you uh, interacted with your wife? Of course, they live together. Uh, uh since Friday up to I've been up to today. With her. Yeah, I've been interacting with my family up to today. 
How many children have you? Two. You got two children? Yes, sir. Oh my so God. you you tell yourself or oh, you call the health people to come for you? Yes, sir. Okay. So who went for you today? You say the health people. Who did they introduce themselves to you as? They say who are oh. they? Oh, watch out for getting the other guy in here. So, they, uh, so as we speak, you're right in front of the shuffling uh, barracks? Uh, right now, the, the driver is in the car along uh, with other person in the car with me. We all sit in the car. Six hours he's, he was in the Can ambulance Can I speak today. to the driver? Is it possible? I talk to the driver or any other person closest uh, to the driver? It's a threat because whenever, whenever I give him the phone, you can say no. You don't want to talk to him. You don't know why. The driver doesn't want to hold the corona. The phone, he told me to pull the possible phone. corona phone. guy's phone? But right now, uh, my phone lasts because I get popping. So... Folks, you heard it. You heard Nat Blaman's driver. Six hours up until the time he spoke to Kelvin Deming. They had kept him in the ambulance for six hours, parked in front of the Camp Shuffling military barracks on the Robbers Street Highway. He voluntarily called them after he learned that his boss had tested positive for corona. He did the right thing, the honorable thing to do. You heard him say also on Sunday he went to S. Troen Nangbe Church. They had a concert there. I'm told he's a drummer for his church. First Baptist Church and his church, his choir from his church, was participating in a concert they had at S.T. Nangbe, Taitim Street St. Hall. And he's the drummer. So yesterday, Sunday, he was in church. He played the drum, he interacted with people, and he must have, if he has the virus, which is possible, which is likely, considering he drove his bus. Now his bus, I presume, was driving, was riding in a front seat with him. If he sneezed, or he coughed, or if he touched something, because the virus can stay on surface areas for days. If you, if, if you held a, 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 a uh, if you held a steering wheel, and you didn't wipe it, if you held, if you sat in a seat or you touched something or your sweat went on some, something, the virus can last, can stay on that surface area for many days. And if somebody has touches it and they touch it and they can, they can come in contact with the virus and if they, they can touch their face or something and they can contract the virus. And so you heard him say that they kept him in the ambulance for six days. Now imagine, I mean for six hours up until the time he made this call. He had been in the ambulance parked in front of the Camp Kesseli barracks for six hours in the ambulance and a, a coronavirus suspect. Let's put it that way for a lack of a better word. Imagine how this thing could spread in Liberia when now Blama, his boss, is complaining that he had been at redemption for many hours since this morning they took him there. He had no food, no medication, nothing whatsoever, no ele electricity. His driver was in the ambulance for six hours waiting to even be admitted into any facility. Nothing of the sort had happened because Liberia has nothing in place. Now, you need to know this. You need to share this video to as many people as possible and spread the word. The country does not have any readiness we're not prepared to deal with this virus so here is what we must do we must self-quarantine if we must we must avoid bodily contacts no handshakes we must carry with us hand sanitizers wash our hands every time you freaking can if you have offices somewhere, all your offices have buckets with Clorox water in them. Make it mandatory that people wash their hands before they come in. If you are a security guard or a banker or a teller who is a cashier, you're dealing with money. Money is one of the, the, the chief means by which the virus can be spread. You need to wear gloves to deal with your customers if you must because you can't be dealing with money and be washing your hands every time or, or using hand sanitizer every time. That's pretty unrealistic. But you need to wear those very thin gloves because you're dealing with money and you're dealing with a lot of people. So the issue here is your government has no 
infrastructure in place to deal with the virus. I remember when Ebola struck us, it took many, many months before Liberia was able to deal with Ebola, which is why it killed almost 5,000 people in, in Liberia. It didn't start in Liberia. It only spread over to Liberia from Guinea. And we know how many people it killed. It killed way more people in Liberia than it did in the Mana River uh, region. And so Liberia does not learn from 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 the past we we so we are supposed to be ahead of the curve we are supposed to have beds have facilities set up deploy the medical staff the people to to receive these people and be able to treat them but we don't have any of that in place we don't and i'm saying this this is not political i am not being political as i said all of us, my humble appeal to everyone, including my supporters, my friends, let's remove the political partisan lenses and protect ourselves. Nat Blama, we all should be in prayer with him. That driver, we all should be in prayer with him. And everybody else, including the driver's own family. If Nat Blama has corona, there's a strong chance his driver might have contracted it. If his driver has it, there's a strong chance that his, his driver's wife and children and everybody else who he came in contact with might have the virus. If the driver went to church, as he said, he played the drum in church on Sunday at ST Nangba Church, which is a very big church. They had a concert. It's very possible he he must have he, he 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 might have spread the virus to people there. We need to pray, but more than praying, we need to be careful. Follow all of the public health measures that have been uh, you know that you read on social media and wash your hands and avoid touching surface areas and if you've got gloves yourself you can wear your own gloves those plastic gloves you if you find some of them you can wear them so the issue here is our brothers and sisters on the other side of the aisle many of them will still be defending the government they will still be defending the government in the face of a major health public health crisis that is about to erupt in our own country. Imagine a country like America is complaining that they, they don't have enough resources to deal with this stuff. Not money, they have money. The Trump administration approved what, $8 billion to fight Corona? But to even get the logistics together, it's overwhelming. The state of New York is complaining. The mayor of, of Los, uh, Los Angeles just announced that they're putting the city of LA on lockdown. A whole country like Italy with what, 60, 80 million people? They are locked down. This thing is serious. Protect yourselves. Protect your families. But more than anything else, the economic downturn. <laughs> you remember what happened post Ebola? The economy of Liberia plummeted. It plummeted. The, the, corona, the economic impact from Corona will be even greater than Ebola. Here is why. Liberia is a donor-dependent country. Yes, 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 yes. Many donors left the country years ago, and many of them have been scaling down their operations, but there are still many donor-funded projects in the country. Direct uh, government donor-funded projects and, you know, private sector or NGO donor-funded projects in the country. Now, the donor countries are catching hell. Ebola, I mean, Corona is raging hell. It's destroying their economies all over these donor countries. Hmm? It is destroying their economies. Imagine what it's going to do. That means the donor countries are not going to be so generous. The commitments they made to our country, some of these commitments are captured in our national budget. We have captured some of these uh, promises, these donor commitments, some of them have been captured in our national budgets. We expect that these donations would come in. But these donor countries are going through a very economically and, 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 and a cat 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 catastrophic uh, experience with uh, Corona. So you tell me, they are going to be focused on rebuilding their own economies as opposed to honoring their donor commitments to countries such as Liberia. So the effect, the effect of the coronavirus on the Liberian economy ha, will be disastrous. It will be worse than Ebola. It's another thing. 30% or 25% of our GDP comes from abroad. 
remittances by Liberian to lay, particularly in the U.S., which accounts for something around 20, I mean, 75 percent of about 350 to 400 million dollars a year repatriate repatriated to Liberia each year to support family members and, and do stuff and all that. A lot of Liberians here are going to start holding back because generally people in the U.S. and people in other parts of the world who are facing this coronavirus pandemic are going to be cutting back, already cutting back on their expenditures, the way they're expending. They're curbing their consumption. They're not consuming as much as they used to. And they're going to also not be sending as much money as they used to. And so what that, what that is going to do is going to see a decreased inflow of USD into Liberia from Liberians who live in the diaspora. That is the problem. So you are going to see reduced amounts of money coming from Liberians in America, coming from Liberians in Europe and Asia, going to Liberia. And when you see that, it means there will be reduced consumption, domestic consumption in Liberia, funded by remittances sent by Liberians abroad. Then you're going to see donor countries are going to not they are going to renege, not intentionally, not deliberately, but they are not going to be able to give, to honor their donor commitments to our country. So you're going to see less money coming in to fund projects that should have been done if the coronavirus had not struck. You're going to also see a scale down of economic activities in general. How so? You're going, you're, you're going to see that uh, donors, I mean investors, people who are planning, People who already have investments in the, in the country, they're going to be scaling down their operations. Eh? You are you're, you're going to see that. You are going to see, people are going to say, let's wait and see how this virus thing will, will pan out. Whether it will get worse, we can put our money in now. There's a great deal of unpredictability. There's a great deal of uncertainty, which is what has hit the, 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 the stock exchange and which is causing a huge cataclysm that is causing billions, I mean, what trillions of dollars around the world, around stock markets around the world to get wiped out. So the world, the, the world, the, the, the economy, the global economy cannot be so heavily impacted by this virus and Liberia remains unaffected or unscathed by it. It is going to affect us in huge, huge, on a huge scale. And our government, which is so incompetent, does not even understand what skill they need us they need to begin to find to put in place some measures now that could need to get the economic impact because now you're going to see less and less money money gram transfers to liberia less and less western union transfers to liberia and you're going to see reduced uh, uh cash inflows i mean to the, to the to the country because of the coronavirus so it is extremely scary again before i end this video wash your hands be careful Protect your families, protect your kids, and just be careful. That's all I can say. Do not rely on the government. Follow the health protocols that have been advertised. Follow them. That is all you can do. Pray for your country. Pray for yourselves. Pray for your friends. If this thing lasts for a few more months, it's going to be a very serious disaster. Thank you very much. God bless you all.